All right, guys, welcome back. We're on our second reading, chapters three and four of Gary Paulson's Masters of Disaster. So thanks again to Gary Paulson and Scholastic for allowing teachers to read aloud online during this COVID mess that we're in and when we're not in school together. All right, we're on chapters three or chapter three right now, Wildlife in the Woods. All right, men, here's the next plan. Henry reached into his locker after third period and pulled out a yellow legal pad. He cleared his throat and started reading to Reed and Riley. Because it's Friday, we head for the bush directly after school this afternoon, and we don't come back until Sunday, two days living by our wits. We don't bring anything but the clothes we're wearing. No food, no matches, no shelter, nothing. I found the perfect spot on the map. It's in the woods by where the railroad bridge crosses the river. It's totally deserted. Today, like in four hours when school gets out, Reed, who'd been leaning against the wall, slipped to a sitting position on the floor. Henry nodded. Spontaneity! It adds excitement to the event. Henry shook his head. I still smell duty from the bike jump last week. It's like it's in my pores. Maybe you still smell it, but you don't reek. That 15th shower, I think, did the trick. So that means we're ready for the second plan. Plus, this may well be the greatest idea a young male has ever conceived and executed since great ideas started to be kept track of. Riley was only half listening as he mentally tabulated the essentials he had in his backpack. His first aid kit, $7.89 in loose change, a ball of twine, a Swiss army knife, a roll of duct tape, a small radio, his old walkie-talkies, extra batteries, and his last will and testament. He hadn't known of Henry's camping trip, of course. This was standard gear he never left the house with because he believed in always being prepared for any eventuality. Here's the plan, Henry said. We head into the bush down on the river, and for two days we make shelter, we find food, we live as one with the great outdoors, just like our pioneer, um, what's that word? Forefathers. Is this a great idea or what? Wait, wait, Reed tried once more. How about if the idea of wilderness is more like camping in the backyard, and it's okay to go inside and watch TV, eat Twinkies, and use the bathroom? Maybe even sleep in the house when it gets dark and cold and the bugs come out. That seems more us than the woods and no supplies thing. What sounds like you sissy boys is going shopping at the mall with my little sister for training bras and lip gloss. Dwight Hauser had been lurking around the corner, eavesdropping. He had three of his middle, his mindless goons with him. Hello, Dwight, Henry said, listening in on other people's conversations again. Don't you have anything better to do? You mean like you guys playing camp in the woods? You'll last 12 minutes before Reed here pees himself and Riley walks into a tree because he's got his head stuck in a book. Dweebs and brainiacs and whatever it is you are, Mosley can't handle the outdoors. Thanks for your feedback, Hauser. We needed the input of a moron. Run along now and take your sycophants with you. That means brainless followers, by the way, Riley said, leading Reed and Henry down the hall and out the door. Nice one, Riley. You have the greatest vocabulary, Henry said. Did you see how confused they looked when Riley called them sick of what it, what's it's? Reed was practically bouncing with excitement. I've been waiting for a moment like that since first grade when Dwight first told me the paste pot was full of cake frosting. I'll show him I can camp outside. What do you think, Riley? I want to see what happens. I'm in. It's unanimous, Henry beamed. We'll head to the woods immediately after school. The great thing is, no preparation necessary. This is probably the easiest plan I've ever come up with. Oh, wait. Reed, call home and tell your folks you're sleeping at Riley's. Riley, tell your folks you're staying at my place, and I'll tell my parents I'm at Reed's. I have to interject and say, never lie to your parents about where you are. Never. It's not okay. Reed and Riley both nodded. Reed's house was so full of gir girls he wouldn't be missed, and although Riley was an only child, his parents were always happy when he was out with his friends instead of sitting in his room with a book. Henry's parents breathed a little easier and slept a little deeper when they didn't have to worry about what plans he was concocting under their roof. Ever since the vinegar and baking soda incident in the garage that had forced Henry's parents to call the police hazmat teams and park their cars in the driveway for a whole summer. Henry smiled through the rest of his classes, daydreaming about campfires and lean-tos made of sticks and leaves and dried mud. Reed went to the restroom 12 times and wondered, could you possibly get frostbite in May? Riley spent the afternoon free period in the library, best place ever, researching native nuts and berries that were safe to eat and brushing up on his recognition, recognition of poison oak and poison ivy. They met up under the flagpole after the final bell rang and started walking toward the edge of town. No one talked very much. Gradually, the residential neighborhoods turned into rundown industrial complexes, and then they found the rail yard. After checking his map, Henry pointed them toward a rail line that ran away into the woods. Why is it so dark? Is it always so dark in the wilderness? Reed said as the sun started to dip below the horizon. 
he stumbled on a rock, a root, or a poisonous snake. He wasn't sure which. Just in case, he jumped about six feet straight up. I've never seen so much darkness, even when I close my eyes at night. That's probably because Amy, my second littlest sister, is so afraid of the dark that we leave the bathroom light on and the light in the hall and the one on the stairway. So it's never, you know, ever really dark at my house. You talk a lot when you're nervous, Riley said. I talk a lot longer. It took a lot longer to get here than I thought, Henry finally admitted. But anyone can set up a camp in the daylight with gear. It's really something to be out here with nothing in the dark. We need to find a campsite quick, though, before things start to go wrong. Not that I think they will, of course. I have a gut feeling that everything is going to work out for us this weekend. There was an enormous splash followed by a sputtering scream, then a gurgle and the sound of a bunch of brush breaking, and finally a thump as if something large and wet had dropped from a great height into thick mud. I found the river, Reed called. Good, Henry said. Now we, now we know we aren't going to die of thirst. I'm not sure that's the most sanitary suggestion, Riley pointed out. Do you know what Connor Howes did in this river after he drank 18 sodas during the scout camp out last year? Too late, Reed said from the darkness. I've already swallowed about a gallon, so I don't want to hear any more about Connor and the river of pee. Oh, come on, men, Henry said. This isn't so rough. It's not like there are bears and moose and mosquitoes and other things that want to eat us. We're out here in the tame woods where nothing can go wrong. He was interrupted by a deep coughing, cacking, growling sound that seemed to shake the leaves on the trees. Even Henry was silent. Then Reed, who'd squelched back to his friends by following the sound of Henry's voice, leaned in and whispered, What was that? Probably some kind of night bird. I saw a video where night birds sounded just exactly like that, so I'll bet that's what it was then. A night bird, just a bird, a small vegetarian bird who won't swoop too close to us or rake us with her talons or carry us back to the nest in her beak to feed alive and squirming to her babies. There was a second coughing growl much closer and with an instant, an insane laugh. I smell duty again, Reed said. Brand new though, and right behind me, like it's following me. They heard another frightening laugh, followed by a bone-rattling howl. A high-pitched shriek made them jump, and then a cataclysmic whoosh roared through the darkness as something huge splashed in the river. At this precise instant, Riley decided to pull out the small pen light he had taped to his leg for emergencies. It wasn't that he was afraid, although he worried that certain of his bodily functions were coming close to being uncontrollable. Rather, he just wanted to know why night birds would seem so A. Loud, B. Big, and C. Plentiful. In some measure, he would for the rest of his life, and especially during REM sleep after he'd had too much sugar or caffeine, regret this decision. He turned the light on, and the three boys found themselves looking at a full-size Bengal tiger, standing 3.6 feet away. <laughs> Riley flicked the light off. He counted to three, took a deep breath, prayed for a night bird, and turned the light back on. The tiger stood motionless for a moment before opening his mouth and bearing teeth that looked a yard long. Before Reed could even whimper, something waist high and covered with stinking hair poked him in the back, waffled a loud chuckling sound, grabbed him by the seat of the pants, and headed off through the undergrowth, dragging him along by his back pocket. Call 911! Riley and Henry didn't even turn to watch Reed disappear into the brush. They stood frozen, staring at the tiger. He stared back at them. Meanwhile, Reed kicked and twisted free of his pants and the monster that had him by his back pocket. He fell in the dirt, rolled twice and crouched in the darkness, frantically looking around for whatever had grabbed him and then had just as suddenly disappeared. I'm free, he assured Riley and Henry. Certainly were frantic with fear for him. Don't worry, I got away. He stood, pantless, trying to catch his breath and figure out which way to trot back to Henry and Riley. Before he could move, though, something slithered out of the darkness and wrapped around his bare leg, holding tight. He looked down and saw what he thought was a gray anaconda, about half a foot thick. Hey, he called to Henry and Riley, suddenly and insanely calm. A second monster thing just grabbed me. It's got me by the leg. I'm not free anymore. Then the gray snake-like thing yanked him into the brush near the riverbank, and the calm deserted him, and he screamed, Henry! Riley cast the flashlight beam toward the river, where he and Henry saw a half-naked reed being swung through the air and then plunged back under the surface of the water, and then up again, then under again, then up again. Between dunks in the muddy pea water, he screamed, Call! Dunk! Nine! Dunk! One! Dunk! One! In the weak glow of the penlight, Henry and Riley could see only a gray wall and one bright eye between reed, behind reed. The tiger, which had swung his head to watch Reed, turned back to the two boys, cough growled again and moved forward, putting his front paws on Henry's shoulders and licking the top of his head with a rough, wet tongue. Then the tiger nuzzled the side of Henry's face, looking for all the world like an enormous house cat. Man, he seems to like you, Riley said, or maybe he's just tasting you. 
No, he's definitely being friendly. That doesn't look like a hungry kind of licking. Freaky, though, huh? To run into a tiger in the woods of suburban Cleveland? Not as weird as the thing that got Reed, though. About then, Reed broke away from what he was thinking must be the sinister boy-eating, water-dwelling snake creature of Cleveland. Reed clambered up the riverbank and hit the ground running full speed at what Riley's report later estimated was 37.2 miles per hour. He crashed into hanging limbs, tree trunks, antils, rocks, and bushes, leaving thick clouds of duty odor in his wake and emitting blood-curdling screams that echoed in the darkness. As Henry and Riley and, of course, the tiger stood listening to Reed's terrified bellows, which were becoming more and more distant, a stocky man in khaki pants and a t-shirt that proclaimed, eat plants, not animals, suddenly emerged from the darkness. He was carrying a huge flashlight and leading a hyena on a leash. I'm Amazing Dave, owner of Amazing Dave's Wild Animal Show. We're traveling around the Midwest. A couple of cages got unlocked by mistake and some of our troop wandered away. This is Mizzen, my hyena, and I think she ate your buddy's pants before I caught her. You're already, you already met Nick here, and I thank you for not scaring him. He's kind of timid. Before he started running around yelling like that, your friend was playing in the water with Simon the Elephant. Simon has a game with his handler where he dunks him underwater. He thinks everybody likes to play. Dave stuck his fingers in his mouth and let loose with a piercing whistle. They heard a thumping splash and some crashing of bushes, and Simon lumbered out of the darkness. He draped his trunk around Riley's shoulders and turned to watch Nick kiss Henry's scalp. They seem to like people, Riley petted the elephant's shoulder. I mean, they didn't, you know, like, eat us, like one might normally expect from wild animals. Dave smiled. They're very affectionate and used to being around people. Mizzen here particularly likes chocolates. Did the other boy have candy bars in his pockets? That might be why he grabbed his pants. She grabbed his pants and then ate them. Sorry about that. We weren't supposed to bring anything with us for the weekend camping trip I planned, but Reed does like chocolate. Henry trailed off, realizing how self-righteous he sounded. We were practicing wilderness survival. <laughs> Since our animals sort of messed up your camping trip, on behalf of Amazing Dave's Wild Animal Show, I'd like to invite you to stay with us this evening. Reed's screams were growing fainter and fainter. Henry cupped an ear with his palm, listening intently, and then shook his head. We'd like to. We really would. But we'd better go after Reed. He sounds like he's halfway to Canada. Some other time then, Dave said, you can meet the other animals. I have a howler monkey named Pixie that your running friend would probably enjoy. They sound exactly alike. Henry and Riley didn't catch Reed in the woods. By following the sound of his screams, they finally found him on the outskirts of town, hiding in some bushes next to a farm implement dealer. I don't want to complain or whine or anything, Reed said from underneath a lilac bush, but man, that was some pretty wild stuff back there. First off, that furry laughing bear thing tried to eat my butt, and then that gigantic snake thing tried to drown me. It was kind of like that time in kindergarten when Dwight Hauser and I were taking swimming lessons together, and he used me as a flotation device. Only I didn't. Float, that is. You were amazingly brave, Riley assured Reed. He dragged him out from under the lilac bush. You think? Reed looked thoughtful. Is that what brave feels like? Yep, Henry said. It's kind of like sheer terror, only with a whole lot of adrenaline and a happy ending. Henry gave Reed his jacket to tie around his waist and cover what was left of his underwear. They started walking home in the darkness. This report, Riley said, ought to be a corker. It could have been worse, Reed said as he trudged along behind Henry and Riley, his voice scratchy and raw from approximately three and a half miles of screaming. I didn't wind up completely covered in duty this time. I lost my pants, but I saved my underwear, or most of it. And I escaped from a scary thing that ate my pants and got away from another scary thing that wanted me dead. Or at least really clean. How did you guys get away from that tiger anyway? Luck, Henry said. Just luck. All the planning in the world men can't compare to perfectly timed good luck. Chapter 4 is called Night of the Living Sludge. Men, Henry announced to Reed and Riley during lunch the next week, spritzing air freshener in Reed's direction because he smells, still smelled a little funky. We are going to spend the night in the dumpster. Reed grabbed the air freshener and shot it back at Henry. I still say I'm not the only one who smells bad. You must have stepped in tiger poo or else the tiger's spit reacted with your shampoo. Did you just say you want us to sleep in a garbage can? Riley pushed aside his soup and pulled out his notebook to start outlining Henry's new plan. This was not originally on my list of possible activities to pursue, Henry confessed, gesturing to his yellow legal pad. But I was sitting in investigative science this morning, listening to Mrs. Trudy's Miss Trudy's lecture about the environment, when I realized that scientific experimentation is the highest form of discovery and personal growth. To learn, to find, to know, to use science to uncover mysteries. What could be more exciting and interesting than that? And you think spending the night surrounded by garbage is scientific, Riley asked. 
Sure, haven't you ever wondered about the contents of dumpsters and trash cans and garbage buckets and waste paper baskets? Uh, no, Reed said. I have never once thought about what gets thrown away. Neither had I, and I can't believe we're overlooking something so essential and meaningful. Besides, up to now, our activities had been lacking in practical application, not to mention cultural significance. This task will lead us toward not only getting science scholarships for college, but also saving the world, one garbage heap at a time. Reed looked doubtful and went back to his sandwich. But Riley pulled out the catalog for a local university that he carried in his backpack because he believed in being prepared for every eventuality. He flipped to the section on scholarships. Henry's right. There's a scholarship contest for, Riley began to read, the study of environmental protection by middle school students. The requirements, undertaking an original experiment, which must be totally self-directed, depending completely on the support and guidance of one's peers, and the submission of a paper detailing the hypothesis, experiment, results, and conclusions, as well as suggestions for bettering society. He looked up. We could totally do this. I want to see what happens. I'm in. Henry said, yes, this is about our future, men. I knew this idea was perfect for us. I'm glad we're all in agreement. He wrinkled his nose and spritzed air freshener in Reed's direction again. Now, about the division of labor. Let me guess, Reed folded his arms. You're doing all the idea making and hypothesizing, and Riley here is writing up the scholarship application afterward, which leaves me to be the one to actually sleep with the garbage. Oh, you won't be sleeping, Henry said. You'll be too busy collecting specimens, and it won't be all night. You just need to scoop up a few samples of different kinds of waste for us to catalog and identify and experiment upon. That part we'll all do together. I don't know why we can't do the whole collecting thing together, too. I already smell baby duty every minute of every day. I think the contents of that diaper got slammed up into my brain and the river pee burned into me on a cellular level because when I sweat in gym class, I could smell it really bad. See, Henry nodded, you're the ideal candidate for this part of the project. And if it makes you feel any better, I'm going to be gathering specimens from the recycling bins at the same time. Reed looked satisfied and Riley carefully penciled into his notes. Reed, rancid garbage. Henry, old newspapers. Henry continued, there's a huge dumpster outside school that we can use for our research. Just think of all the good stuff from the home at kitchens. We're in luck too because the eighth grade science section is covering dissection this week, starting with frogs and working up to fetal pigs. So the science labs will throw away lots of interesting garbage. Furthermore, I happen to know from eavesdropping on the cafeteria ladies while I was in the lunch line that the new and improved super nutritional menu is not meeting with approval from the student body and the disposal rate is unacceptably high. Um, excuse me? A soft voice broke into their conversation. They looked up and saw Marcy Robbins standing next to their table, blushing furiously. I wasn't trying to listen in on your conversation, but I happen to know that Miss Myers, the art teacher, is working on creating a new kind of biodegradable modeling clay with her classes, and it's not going well. Or maybe too well. Statues are rotting while the students make them. The only thing more astonishing than being helped out in their plan was being talked to by Marcy Robbins, who was so painfully shy that she hardly ever spoke in class. Hey, thanks, Marcy. That's good stuff, Henry said. A perfect wet-to-dry ratio, Riley said, nodding. Do you want to come with us? Reed asked, hopefully. Oh, no. Marcy looked horrified. Or terrified. The boys couldn't tell. I just, well, wanted to be helpful. Good luck with your project and um, the whole odor thing you've got going here. I think your idea sounds fascinating. She practically ran out of the lunchroom. That's the most words I've ever heard from Marcy in all the years we've been going to school together, Reed said, looking after her as she fled. Riley nodded. She's good people. Let's meet this evening after dinner and get to work, Henry said. Today is always your favorite day of the week to start a plan, Reed sighed. You might stop stinking if we don't get going this evening, and that would be a waste of perfectly good stench, Henry said before he and Riley put their heads together to reread the experiment standards and protocols in the catalog. Well, sure, when you put it that way. Reed carried his lunch bag over to the trash, dropped it in, peered down, and said into the bin, See you later. <laughs> Henry and Riley were pacing next to the dumpster outside the cafeteria that evening, waiting for Reed to show up. They had told their parents they were meeting at the library to work on a science project, which was mostly true and more likely to be agreed to, to than asking for permission to go dumpster diving. Finally, they heard a rustling noise from the darkness and turned to see Reed hurrying toward them. He was wearing a rain poncho and waterproof trousers, reaching from his armpits to attached rubber boots. Good thinking, Reed, Henry said. I should have mentioned protective gear. I like the way you wrapped your entire body in plastic cling film before you put your clothes on. That was smart, because you can't, after all, be too safe. You didn't by any chance ask your mother when your last tetanus shot was, did you? Not 
he hurried on, that, that you'll need it, but it's just always good to know. Henry slapped a headlamp from his dad's last camping trip onto Reed's forehead as Riley slid a, back, slid a backpack over Reed's shoulders. He filled it with small glass vials and Ziploc bags from his home science kit, and then Henry handed Reed a plastic bucket with a lid for scooping up the mushy bottom layer from the dumpster, and Riley gave him a stick to stir the more interesting garbage around. Now remember, Henry instructed Reed, we need a wide sample, solids, liquids, whatever that oozy sludgy stuff is leaking out of the bottom. Don't come out until you've filled the tubes and jars and Ziploc bags in that bucket with research material. I'm heading over to the recycling bin to gather a selection, and Riley's going to crawl in through the window of the science lab that I propped open with a textbook earlier today and get started on the report. You and I will meet up back here in one hour at precisely 2100 hours with our specimens and head to the lab to start the experiments together. Reed sighed, pulled his uncle's scuba mask over his eyes and nose, adjusted the painting mask he'd found in the garage over his mouth, yanked on the, rubber ye the yellow rubber gloves his mother used to do the dishes, and climbed into the dumpster. He was about to ask Riley to check him for exposed sections of skin when Henry flipped the lid shut and Reed was plunged into total darkness. He heard Riley's and Henry's footsteps getting fainter. He hadn't been in the dumpster three seconds when he knew he wasn't alone. He reached up and flipped the switch on the headlamp. Eyes shone at him from the other end of the dumpster. The eyes were yellow. He moved his head so the light no longer hit what he decided was either a very large rat or a very small rhino. In either case, the garbage-eating beast stayed at the other end, and Reed decided to focus on collecting trash as quickly as he could, while hoping the rhino rat didn't have family and friends in the dumpster. The thing looked, Reed thought, a little like Dwight Hauser, with the same kind of hulking presence and small, mean eyes. Except he'd bet the rhino rat had a better personality. Bacterial fungus, he thought, had a better personality and made more interesting company than Dwight Hauser. The first thing he saw when he looked down was food from the cafeteria. My mother, he thought, would have an absolute fit if she knew how many vegetables got thrown away from the lunch trays. If you don't eat your vegetables, she said at every meal, and chew them properly, you'll lose your teeth. Then your thinking will become muddled, causing you to forget how to spell and do basic math, after which you'll flunk out of school. Without a proper education, you'll never get a decent job, and sooner or later you can count on winding up in prison or living in a dumpster. He heard a new sound, whispered, call 911 to make himself feel better and tried to convince himself it was merely the rhino rat busily eating disposed of vegetables in order to get big and strong as it sat quietly off to the side watching Reed collect garbage. He carefully bagged seven blackened carrots, three moldy snow peas, a clump of corn niblets that hung together mysteriously, and two chicken nuggets that squirmed with something small, white, and alive. Ugh. He tossed a sandwich crust at the rhino rat and then pawed through the first level of garbage to the next. He plucked several frog carcasses off the top of the... Of Top. Ah! He plucked several frog carcasses off the top of the layer and hoped they were from the biology lab and not the lunchroom. He grabbed a clump of something that looked like what the plumber had pulled from his sister's shower drain last fall. He carefully sealed it in one of the larger Ziploc bags. He poked a plastic garbage bag with his stick and it burst open. A river of green and runny guinea pig, mouse, white rat, frog, and turtle poop from the science labs spreading out across his feet. Oh, oh good, he thought. Duty. Even the rhino rat looked disgusted and edged farther away from Reed. Don't throw up, don't throw up, don't throw up. You'll just have to bag it for Henry, he chattered to himself. Can't smell a thing, not scared at all. The rhino rat isn't going to brush up against me because he's staying on his side of the dumpster and I'm way over here. Nothing just scurried across my foot. Almost done. Hate Henry, hate Riley. Move into, food. Move into Fiji. He found that keeping up a running monologue prevented him from thinking too hard about the squishy goo and gelatinous muck he was getting to as he dug deeper. He couldn't smell anything from behind his scuba and painting masks. The gloves and plastic wrap protected his skin from any direct contact, and he was beginning to feel almost comfortable flipping through the layers of crud and ooze when he tossed aside a broken cafeteria tray and find a shimmering puddle of slimy, sludgy, not quite solid, not quite liquid, spongy, semi-organic material that seemed to move away from him when he tried to scoop it up. Even the rhino rat looked surprised at that. Reed searched for additional sign of life in the ooze and then decided that whatever it was, wasn't actually alive. He closed his eyes, reached down, and slid his bucket through the middle of the puddle. It had the consistency of jello and snot. He secured the lid on top. Done. He climbed out of the dumpster, dragging his bucket and backpack behind him. He waved goodbye to the rhino rat, slammed the cover on the dumpster, and sat down to wait for Henry. He pretended not to hear the sudden increase in noise inside the dumpster. He imagined that microscopic crawly things were slithering all over his skin under the plastic wrap. Maybe I've got the plague, he thought, or parasites, or lice, or rhino rat cooties. 
Henry finally showed up with neat paper bags full of tidily folded newspapers and empty soda cans. Henry padded silently while Reed squished and sloshed with every step through the darkened school hallways to the science labs. Riley flipped on a computer and pulled up the rough draft of the paper he'd worked on. He was surrounded by open textbooks and pages of handwritten notes and had a second and third computer logged on to different search sites. He zoomed between the computers on a wheeled desk chair. Henry set his bags on a ta lab table and started to sort through them. He pulled out newspapers and magazines and clucked disapprovingly when he found a plastic pudding cup from the faculty lounge. Reed dragged his bags of specimens to a table in the corner and started undressing. He threw the poncho and waders and scuba mask and painting mask and rubber gloves and miles of plastic wrap that he'd unwound from his body into the hazardous materials disposal bin at the back of the room. Once Reed was stripped down to his bottom layer of regular clothes, which he noted were miraculously clean and dry and stench-free, and had assured himself that nothing tiny, alive, and dangerous was crawling around on him, he stepped over to the table where his specimens were, and with a sense of confidence he didn't usually feel, started to pry the lid off the bucket. We need, Henry was going to say more, but he couldn't, but because, as Riley later wrote in his follow-up report, someone had left a Bunsen burner ever so slightly on after last period science class, and the accumulated methane in the sealed bucket of shimmering, slimy, sludgy, not-quite-solid, not-quite-liquid, spongy, semi-organic material that Reed had collected ignited. The contents of the bucket exploded upward, and the force of the blast carried Reed across the science lab, out into the hall, and into a locker. Except for a wave of glistening slime that stretched from the science table to the hallway, the lab wasn't damaged. I'm okay, Reed's voice echoed from the depths of the locker. I'm wedged pretty tight, but nothing hurts and I'm not bleeding. Good thing we did this after school when no one was around, because we could have gotten in some serious trouble. The contents of the bucket, now completely liquefied from the chemical reaction, dripped down the sides of the locker, drenching Reed, but, as Henry later pointed out, making him slippery enough to pop right out of the tight space without even dislocating his shoulders or hips. Other than some small paper cuts on his fingers, Henry was fine. Riley wasn't hurt except for a slight strain in his right ankle from zooming his desk chair into the hall to check on Reed. I reek of decomposition and fetid rot, Reed said sadly. Remember the good old days when I just smelled, smelled baby duty with every breath and had the constant taste of river pee in my mouth? Yeah, those were good times, Riley said absently as he jammed a flash drive into a computer and started adding to the report details about the minor explosion, eye-watering stench, shimmering wave of gunk, and subsequent removal of Reed from the locker. I think, men, Henry said, that this may be our finest hour. Reed, I'm sure I speak for Riley when I say another exceptional job on your part. Thanks for taking the lead on the heavy lifting part of the experiment. You were great. Reed smiled and ducked his head modestly. I read the directions carefully, Henry went on, and there was nothing about the experiment being a success. We were only supposed to think of one, execute it, and write it up. We're three for three, even if it's going to take us all night and every paper towel in the building to clean up the mess. Henry, Reed said, I don't want to worry anyone or sound like I'm whacked out or anything, but it didn't, it didn't seem to you that the sludge we collected was alive somehow? I mean, it slithered when I tried to catch it, and then it threw me across the building. Maybe whatever that was didn't want to be the subject of our experiment. You just won't mention that in our scholarship application, Henry said. No sense compromising the fine scientific research we've accomplished with superstitious fear that, this, that the discovery of a new light, life form could raise. Besides, the blast probably killed it. All in all, a huge leap forward for the scientific method. I'm pretty sure this is how Galileo must have felt. Or Dr. Frankenstein, Reed said, still sure the sludge had moved away from him. All right, that was chapters three and four. So I'm going to stop this one. And the next video will be chapters five and six.